everybody. I'm Lita Knapp, and I'd like to introduce our speaker for the Scholarly Scoop Virtual Style. We have Professor John Enoch. He's a um, chair of the chemistry department at the University of Wisconsin Whitewater. And as you can read here, he has um, earned his PhD in biochemistry from the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee in 1991. And for the next six years, he served as an officer for the United States Navy. Dr. Enoch then joined Northern Michigan University where he taught analytical, instrumental, general, forensic, and biochemical courses for five years. He came to the University of Wisconsin Whitewater where he continues to teach analytical chemistry courses and serves as the chair of, our, of their department. His research includes analytical chemistry involving trace metal analysis in a wide variety of fields. And that's why he's talking to us today about mercury and fish from Wisconsin in um, our Wisconsin waters. So uh, John is gonna share his screen now and we'll begin his talk. Thank you and uh, let's welcome John. Or Thank you. Professor Enoch. Thank you, Lita. Uh, let me just. All right, so I'm, I'm Dr. Enoch. You can just call me John for today's presentation. Uh, John works really well. I've been called John my whole life and it works well. Um, uh, what, I, what I do wanna do is as I go through my talk today, I will welcome anybody wants to interrupt and ask a question, please, by all means, I, uh, please do. I welcome questions during the presentation. If you wanna hold questions until the end of the presentation, um, you can do that also. So a little bit about me. Um, I am from Wisconsin. I grew up on a dairy farm in northern Wisconsin. Um, I grew up um, a lot of the winters doing ice fishing and various things. So um, fishing in Wisconsin has been kind of something I've done throughout my entire life. So as I got my PhD in chemistry and became an analytical chemist and I started my research in analytical chemistry, uh, there was always this underlining kind of thought in my mind that we have this problem in Wisconsin that um, a, lot, a lot of the lakes have fish in them that have fairly high levels of mercury in them that is a problem from a health standpoint. So that, that's kind of where the interest, I guess, stem from, from this talk today. So what I want to do in today's talk is go over and talk about like why this is a problem, how it became a problem a little bit, and then a little bit about my research that I've done to try to um, address this issue. All right, so typically in a talk, I have an abstract here. Uh, I'll, I'll, a little bit about this, but I think the background is, is important here. Uh, fish, as you know, is an excellent source of nutrients, important part of a di balanced diet. So consuming fish is, is really, really, good for you. It contains like uh, omega-3 fatty acids. It's a very good source of protein. All of these things are really, really good for you. Um, there's this underlining problem, however, that fish often contains methylmercury. And methylmercury is this highly toxic compound that affects uh, people adversely, uh, particularly with neurological functions. So really, to kind of give you an introduction, what we did is this research project was based around doing research. Is there anything we can do about this from the standpoint that once we have a fish fillet, is there any way we could kind of re we remove some of the mercury through a food processing method and make the food safer for consumption? Um, I kind of want to start off here today giving you some background information. Uh, th this is a nice slide here. It's a cartoon kind of shows you why, why do we have this problem? And there's, there's a couple of reasons why um, is the common belief is, is why this has became a problem, but it, it's not as simple as it might appear. So one of the main things is we have these coal fired power plants that generate electricity and we all need electricity. So this is important. But one of the side effects of this is you get from burning the coal, you get mercury being released in the emissions into the atmosphere. And then you get this atmospheric deposition of very low levels of mercury across the landscape, which some of them ends up in our surface waters. Um, and this is really, really a, a, a very, very small amount. It's hard to explain to people how small of amount this is, but it is, 
you know, I'll give a level out there that most of our surface waters are below three parts per trillion in concentration. So we're, we're, we're talking, you know, if, if we're talking picograms, I mean, I know that doesn't mean a lot to anybody, but what I can tell you is, is that's kind of a, a concentration that is almost at such a small level, it's hard to even wrap your mind around. And what happens then is the bacteria in these water changes this inorganic mercury, because this was just elemental mercury, kind of gets deposited in the water. The bacteria uh, get them, um, well, well, just have water going through their systems and they convert inorganic mercury into methyl mercury. And then small fish start eating the bacteria, some bigger fish eat the small fish and so on and so forth. And what goes on then is this methyl mercury kind of keeps getting transferred through the food chain until it, what happens is it bioaccumulates. And this can build up over time. So essentially what starts off is this tiny insignificant amount of mercury as we move up the food chain starts to become a very significant process due to bioaccumulation. And what the result is, is then when we catch a larger fish, prepare it for a meal and eat it during our dinner, we're consuming a significant amount or, or at least a uh, amount of methylmercury uh, into our diets here that's, that, that we need to be aware of and concerned about. And if we eat too much or get too much exposure to methylmercury, we end up with neurological problems, uh, things like um, loss of memory, numbness, uh, lots of diff various types of nervous systems because the methylmercury ends up accumulating uh, into our nervous system. Uh, to kind of give you an idea why this is a problem, the mercury starts off at one level here, then maybe it starts off at three or four parts per trillion here, which is really low. But once we get to a larger predator fish, it can, it can accumulate um, to uh, I'm, uh, just uh, a million times the concentration in the fish than it actually is in the, in, in the water. So this is why it's a problem. It's this, it's this whole process that here that this is really a very small amount. I, want, I need to emphasize that. And then by the time it gets into the fish, the fish's mercury concentration, again, is like a million times higher in concentration than the, what's actually in the water. Um, this is a map of the United States. This was uh, pulled off a website from the US Geological Survey. And it kind of gives you an illustration of the um, deposition of mercury through or atmospheric mercury deposition. And if you look at kind of the color code, as you get to the redder colors and, and the keys down here for what's the concentration of being deposited across the landscape of the United States. What you see here is the in, the, in this northeastern part of the United States is where this becomes an issue. And this is primarily where we have like high densities, population densities. And this is also like along the Great Lakes here where it's easy to bring coal in on freighters and we have a lot of uh, coal-fired power plants along the Great Lakes here. So you get a lot of deposition from this. Some of this also is just due to the fact that um, the actual geology in the area might have higher levels of mercury. So the rocks themselves, there's nothing anybody's done. Uh, there's mercury in the rocks. But one of the things that can come from this is if you have increased carbon dioxide emissions in the region, you can get slight acidification in the rains that take place. And these acidified rains accelerate the release of heavy metals into the environment. So that actually is an indirect effect of why the mercury levels could go up in the lakes and the concentration of mercury in our fish also. So that's kind of give you a background of why this is an issue and what some of the sources are that have caused the problem. Um, I do want to, in Wisconsin, the, the reason this is, was taken on as a research project also is Wisconsin's a $2.5 billion fishing industry. Uh, these, this is numbers from already back in 2006 and employed about 30,000 people. Uh, so it, it's a significant industry in Wisconsin. We have lots and lots of lakes in Wisconsin. And, and as you know, every little town has a couple bait stores and, um, and we have larger industrial industries too. But right from the commercial fishermen to the industrial uh, food processing plants that process fish, uh, this, this has a you know, significant impact on our economy. Uh, you can kind of see from the EPA website, which states tend to be the biggest problems with as far as um, mercury contamination in our lakes and our fish here. And you see Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, right through this band here that you kind of saw from the atmospheric depositions too. 
A um, little bit of, you know, the this, this study, the EPA did a study across the United States um, just to kind of like tell you it's not a Wisconsin issue. This is, this is really a, a global issue, to be honest with you. I could go on about the impact, but the nutshell is when the EPA did this study, a four-year study, they found out that about half of the uh, lakes they found had fish at concentrations that exceeded 0.3 ppm, and this is a part per million. So this tells you that there's 0.3 parts per million of mercury in the actual fish fillets. Uh, which is a level that exceeds the safe value level for mercury in fish that's been designed by the um, FDA. Um, so it's kind of a problem, it's half the lakes that across the United States. What I can tell you too is, you know, there's a bigger global thing going on too here. Uh, if our oceans and seawaters warm up, uh, that causes an increase in mercury in the fish within the oceans, just the warming of the waters. So, you know, there, there's a lot of things going on here uh, to be aware of. Um, you, uh, you've probably heard about other problems may re maybe related to uh, contaminations in waters like PCBs, dioxins, DDT, uh, and so on and so forth. But by mercury is by far, far the biggest contaminant across all of the waters. Uh, as you can see here about, like I said, 50% of the lakes show contaminations for mercury and about 17 for PCBs and so on and so forth. So this, this tends to be one of our big, well, it is one of the, it is the biggest problem as far as contaminants in our waters in regards to uh, causing um, things in our diet that are not safe for us. Uh, a lot of times if you go to a lake, I've, this is an example of a sign you see in Cottage Grove, which is right there. Uh, in Madison, but if you go into northern Wisconsin, you'll see similar types of signs posted by boat landings. So you'll see this actually posted if you go to a lot a boat landing in a lot of lakes throughout Wisconsin, where it says fish taken from the Cottage Grove Lake frequently contain elevated levels of mercury. Uh, then it's saying, you know, you should be advised to limit how much many, much of this fish you eat. And then it kind of has disclosures, and I'll get into this. And it also talks about that this is just normal geological mercury in the rocks and soil in the area. So they're saying geologically, there's just a little bit more mercury in this region than maybe than some other regions. But again, if, if you get any sort of acidification to the rains in the area, it's going to accelerate the release of that mercury from these rocks and soils into the water. So that's a problem. Uh, the Wisconsin DNR issues this pamphlet to say, choose wisely a healthy guide to eating fish in Wisconsin. So if you go to the DNR office, you can pick up these pamphlets. They're available, they're available online. And if you kind of open it up and start looking through these pamphlets, I want to highlight some things particularly related to mercury. Mercury is distributed throughout the fish's muscle tissue. Uh, you can't reduce the amount of mercury by like trying to remove the fat of the fish or the skin of the fish. It's really distributed evenly throughout the fish. So you just, you, I guess the bottom line is here, you're just stuck with what is. And there's no way to like clean your fish or fillet your fish or prepare your fish that's going to help resolve this problem currently. Um, going to take a few minutes on this. So these are actually the guidelines in Wisconsin, and this is based on what they believe is safe for eating. So if you're women of childbearing years, nursing mothers, all children under 15, this is kind of the suggestion that they say individuals in Wisconsin should try to abide by. So these smaller fish that will not contain as much mercury just because they're lower on the food chains, bluegills, crappies, yellow perch, sunfish. They say like if you're in this higher risk category here listed, you should eat one meal of these type of fish a week. And one meal of some of your higher predator fish of walleye, pike, and bass, and like on the top of the food chain for fish like muskies, a do not eat warning. And then women beyond childbearing years and men may eat an unrestricted amount of bluegills, perch, sunfish, one meal per week of some of your higher predator fish and one meal per month of muskies. So this is, this is based on um, how much mercury they think the average amount, or yeah, how much mercury is gonna be in these types of fish. Um, and then they do accordingly of what they believe is safe. You know, I could go on about this whole topic too. Now, I kind of started off, fish is really, really good for you. It contains omega-3 fatty acids. I've kind of touched upon the fact that mercury is not good for you neurologically. But things like omega fatty acids are really good for you neurologically. So you've got this, I guess we got this debate going on in the field right now too. 
is the omega-3 fatty acids better for you than the mercury is bad for you? And I don't have the answer to that, obviously, but this is, this is one of these things where you say, like a lot of people say, oh, I, you know, you know, I, I should be able to eat fish and eat as much as I want. And it's, this is all nonsense. And, and, and maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Uh, what we do know is mercury is very, very bad for you neurologically. What we do know is omega-3 fatty acids are good for you. So when you consume both of those components together, are you ending up with an adverse effect or are you ending up with a benefic you know, an, 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 a benefic benefit to what you're eating there? Um, I don't want to get into that. Uh, the one argument I will make is, is if we lower the mercury concentration, the fish is obviously going to be healthier for you. So uh, th this is again in here. So this is commercial fish. You can buy things like salmon, uh, catfish, pollock, um, maybe some tilapia, things like this, light like canned tuna, canned tuna. And then you get like some of your really, really high predator fish in the ocean, like shark swordfishes. And here you can see a do not eat in one meal. Th these types these types of fish tend to have really, really high mercury concentrations in them because these are long lived fish, very high on the food chain, and they will accumulate sometimes in the three to five part per million mercury range, which is 10 times the recommended maximum level that you should be eating fish at. So I guess a word of warning though with these type of fish is be careful. Um, this will, I'm gonna move, on from, I think I've kind of laid an introduction here. Hopefully people appreciate um, what the problem is here is the fact that we've got these waters within Wisconsin that over the last number of decades has increased in mercury levels ever so slightly, but it's caused a significant problem with mercury accumulating in fish and this fish ending up on our dinner plates and it being consumed into our diets and and the possible adverse effects that can happen from that. Um, I, I talked about it being an excellent source of omega-3 fatty acids. There's also some other antioxidants in fish like selenium. Uh, all fish contain levels of mercury. Some fish contain very low levels though. Uh, those are fish that are, a lot of times you're fish that are raised on farms uh, that are harvested fairly quickly and their controlled environments are very, very low in mercury. And those fish uh, actually advertise as low mercury fish on, you know, in the supermarket for that reason, because they're aware of this. Uh, a billion people across the globe count on fish as their protein source. So this is, you know, this, this is noteworthy. Um, it had, mercury has adverse effects. It's worse in children. It's, uh, so the younger you are, the more it can affect the long-term effects of your neurological system. Um, these adverse effects, if it gets into our children, can decrease the economy production. It's estimated at 8.7 billion, which that, that's kind of a funny number. So getting into this, what is methylmercury? If we look at methylmercury here, um, some chemical characteristics about it. Methylmercury tends to bind or have a high binding affinity to thiol groups, which means it likes to bind to sulfur. So anything biologically in your system, proteins, small organic molecules that have sulfur will bind mercury and will bind mercury fairly strongly. So this is like one of the amino acid, amino acids are really important for us. We have to have our amino acids, but one of them cysteine, cysteine here and methionine, but this is cysteine here, it has the sulfur group. So this tends to be a type of molecule here that would bind to a methylmercury and kind of make this cysteine methylmercury complex right here that once you make this bond, it's, it's molecules like this that can be transported through the blood brain barrier and accumulate in our neurological system and within the brain and areas like this that we don't want them accumulating. And once they get into our neurological system, they're pretty much there to stay. That is the problem. The problem is, is like we don't have any mechanisms or, or any solutions for lowering the level of mercury once it gets into your nervous system. So over the lifetime, if you're lucky enough to live to 90 or 100 years, your entire life, Mercury is kind of just slowly building up in concentration in your neurological system to the point where if you've been exposed to too much mercury throughout your lifetime, it'll start to have some pretty significant adverse effects. All right. Um, it also binds to proteins that have sulfur groups and various things in here. 
Uh, so, so when we started this research project, just knowing the chemical characteristics and some of the physical characteristics about methylmercury and stuff, uh, we decided this was our theory. Uh, we, we do know that under high acid conditions, you can, there's a proton that usually bonds here and protons are acid essentially. You can shift this bond, bonding uh, pathway of the sulfur bonding the methylmercury versus the proton by acidifying the solution. So essentially the bottom line is, is the theory is, is if we get the fish into a more acidic environment, hopefully we can release the mercury from the fish tissue. And if we can release the mercury from the fish tissue, maybe then we can extract it out and remove some of it. And then if we can, on top of releasing the mercury, if we can add a reducing agent and reduce the mercury from this methylmercury into elemental mercury, elemental mercury has this unique property that it has a vapor pressure. And this is really unique for a metal. Uh, this is why when a mercury thermometer or something else breaks in a room and everybody panics and runs out of the room in fear that uh, you're going to be breathing in mercury vapor. And breathing in mercury vapor is really, really bad for you. But it kind of illustrates the fact that mercury will go from a liquid to a gas and exist, you know, just like other things do. Um, mercury has an appreciable vapor pressure, which means it's in the air if it's present. So we wanted to take advantage of that. And if we put all of this into a vacuum system, maybe we can get the mercury to go into the gas phase and then be removed from the, from the fish sample again. So we do this under vacuum conditions. Um, that's a high pressure, I guess a low pressure vacuum to be more accurate. So commercially, this is where I partnered up with uh, a local company, Creative Culinary Solutions, and they they make vacuum tumblers and not for removing mercury, but they use these vacuum tumblers, which has been happening for a very long time. Um, it started in 1980 by Ned Thornton. He kind of was the guy who decided like he could make um, vacuum tumbles for residential use versus commercial use. Commercially, these things are used in food processing plants. What they do is they put meat products, things like fish, things like chicken, and they put them in there. And if they vacuum tumble them under the right um, solution and under these vacuum conditions, essentially it kills the bacteria. So when you kill the bacteria, you're making your food products safer to eat. And you're also hydrating it. And with that hydration process, a lot of times you're removing contaminants, other things that maybe were in the food processing food processing process like phosphates. And then you can freeze it in your freezer and it has a longer shelf life because it's been hydrated, the bacteria has been killed and it, and it tends to show that you can store your foods for longer periods of times after it's gone through this vacuum processing system. So this is the reason why in, with, with the food industry why they've used vacuum tumblers. So we're hoping to piggyback on this and actually use vacuum tumblers in our research to see if we could use that as a tool to help remove mercury from the fish. Um, so the idea was is that we'd use stannous chloride, which is not what you'd want to use in a food processing, but this is just a proof of con concept. So stannous chloride is a reducing agent. So here's our reducing agent. Citric acid is a natural organic acid. So this is how we get the uh, solution to be acidic. And you can tell using something like cit citric acid, we're not acidifying the solutions over the top. We're just trying to like acidify solutions to the same kind of levels that maybe you'd have a lemon or something like that as far as acidic condition. Uh, and then we process the fish in the vacuum tumbler. We take the fish out of the vacuum tumbler. We prepare it for mercury analysis by going through a microwave digestion. Uh, and then we actually do the analysis. We measure the concentration of mercury that was in the tissue both before it went into the vacuum tumbler and after it's come off out of the vacuum tumbler and we hope to see that going through this whole process that we've lowered the level of mercury in the fish tissue and the analysis done by cold vapor atomic fluorescence spectroscopy um, and then obviously we do the analysis of the results. Uh, so the objectives of this project were to obtain 70 to 90 percent mercury removal. We figured if we could do that that would be just the most ideal situation in the world because what that means is is even at 70 percent and you could see the diet restrictions that would allow you to eat, you know, up to three to four times the amount of fish under the same, you know, after reducing it as the current recommended consumption rates. Um, and then if we do this marinating process, why not just try to do various marinades for flavors and stuff? 
and that would be a possible plus too. And then residentially, if you're gonna have these in your kitchen, uh, it needs to be affordable. So these things have to be available for, to put on the market for $300. Now, if you're buying one of these, this is not like exclusively what you'd use it for. Like I said, that, like they, these things are currently being sold and they're being utilized by people. And it's not for the removal of mercury and fish, it's for lots of other reasons, but it would be a, an added bonus. Um, the impact of the technology and why it's important that if we could accomplish this uh, would be just to create health, healthier fish fillets. Um, could create a uh, product that would be healthier for people to consume. Uh, it would help uh, impact both commercial and recreational fishing industries by the fact that it would give a solution to this problem of mercury and fish and you know, that's kind of one of the, that's kind of a, well, that is an Achilles heel of the fishing industry right now is um, if you're going to be consuming fish or eating, you always kind of have this background, background thought in your mind, maybe of like, oh, how much do I eat and what's really good for me? Uh, where maybe that would relieve that question a little bit. And then obviously it's being a big part of our industry. It's important for the economy. Um, kind of went over this whole thing. This is what our mercury analyzer looks like put students in the lab. This is a good project, teaches students all kinds of good analytical techniques and especially in trace metal analysis. Um, it is important to note that mercury being the type of substance it is, uh, we work at really low concentrations. I mean, it's mercury, unfortunately, because it does accumulate in your body throughout the entire lifetime. This is why it's a problem is, is like uh, you just, the levels that we have to work with, um, to be frankly honest with you, sometimes we're concerned if an individual has old fillings in their teeth, which were had mercury in them, that the mercury coming from your breath might be more than the mercury in the samples we're trying to analyze, which is kind of crazy to think about. But from an analytical standpoint, these are the things we try to think about. All right, back to the project here. So what we did here is we obtained uh, northern pike from the Wisconsin DNR. These were high in mercury and they came from lakes in northern Wisconsin. And we also got tilapia fillets that were just sealed from the supermarket. So these were high level mercury fillets. These were tilapia fillets from your commercial, from your grocery store tend to be low in mercury. And then we test for mercury contamination or what is the concentration of mercury in the samples. And then we run them through this experimental process and we see if we're getting any results of mercury removal in the process. So we use stannous chloride, oxalic acid. Before I noticed you said it's citric acid. Uh, oxalic acid is another natural organic acid that's a little bit stronger than citric acid. And then a natural reducing agent also like ascorbic acid. Um, and this is what we found out. If you look at, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on here because I gave you some background. Um, what we found is from an experimental standpoint or a theoretical standpoint, what our theory was, was a pretty good theory. Um, if we just use the ascorbic acid, a reducing agent here in the fish, and what you see on the graph here is this is the percent mercury removed from the first fish fillet, and these were the reducing agents or other acidic components that we added in here. So one, if we just add a reducing agent, and this would be not lowering the pH or not adding any acid into this experiment, what we see is we essentially don't get any mercury removal. So adding a reducing agent by itself has no effect on the process of trying to remove any mercury from the fish. If we add just the acid, so we acidify the solution, we go through this vacuum tumbling step. What we found here is that we got close to a 30% removal in mercury from the fish. Now there's some other variables here of like uh, surface area, um, thickness of the fillet, various things like this that impact this percent mercury removal because what we found is, is it's very, very difficult to get into any depth in this process within the fish tissue, which is not surprising. Um, kind of expected that. But then if we acidify it and add a reducing agent, a strong reducing agent like stannous chloride, which stannous chloride would not be something you could use in a food processing step for human consumption, but it was just proof of concept here that would the, is theoretically that does this work? And we got up to, you know, we got about 50% removal of the mercury from the, from the fish. So from, from conceptual standpoint, yes, this works 
And if you vacuum tumble long enough, what happens is, is this 50%, maybe we can get it as high as like 70, 80%. But the problem is, is then we start compromising if you vacuum tumble too long, the, comp, the, the quality of the fillet itself. We also add other things like uh, MSM. Uh, this is this methyl sulf, sulfone. Uh, this is a sulfur containing compound that we thought might be a good carrying compound of the mercury out of the fish tissue but it's sulfur containing. Um, so things that we dealt with when we experimentally worked on this, there was problems and errors and corrections, obviously. One of the big things, especially when you're doing on a cellular level, uh, do we get the salt concentration in the vacuum tumbler, the solution that we're putting the fish in as hypertonic or hypertonic, or do we switch back and forth? So this is one of the things we played around with on this is, What's, what's, what's the optimal salt concentration in the solution? We're gonna vacuum tumble the fish fillets. Uh, when we're doing measurements, kind of converting wet fish versus dry fish, when you go through this, one of the things, that, this is why, okay, I'm gonna tell you a little secret about the uh, food processing industry here. So one of the reasons why the food processing industry likes to do this vacuum tumbling is, is it hydrates the fish. And you're selling fish maybe, maybe even at $15 an hour, the $15 a pound these days, uh, maybe more, maybe closer to $20 a pound. So if you put 100 pounds of fish fillet in one of these vacuum tumbles and you hydrate the fish, remember you put 100 pounds in there, you do this vacuum tumbling process, you kill some bacteria, you kind of like clean up the fish a little bit, it's, 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 uh, it, it, it increases in quality. But the other thing it does is your 100 pounds of fish now has gone to 110 pounds of fish because it's taken in water. There is no better way in an industry to make money than to start selling water at $20 a pound. So your 100 pounds of fish has now become 110 pounds of fish. And from an um, economical standpoint, that's one of the things too that the, from, from a commercial food processing industry that would be like, hey, let's do this just because it adds to our bottom line and it's economically good for us. Um, anyways, back to this. So wet versus, we have to correct for this factor of whether the fish gains or loses weight. So one of the things we do is we actually dry the fish tissue and then we measure dry concentrations. Then we measure like how much, what was the percent moisture after we vacuum tumble in the fish tissue and we try to make for all these corrections. So. Uh, we're not reducing the mercury concentration just because we've increased some water and that's why it went down. So we are thinking about those things, I guess, is the bottom line. Um, and the other thing that we started to, but we really ran out of time, or I just, you know, time is always an estrogen, is the methyl mercury versus inorganic mercury. And I didn't talk about this, but it's worth something to think about when you start to deal about exposures. So inorganic mercury is just, if you've ever seen like liquid mercury. And for a lot of the people in the audience, when you were kids, you might've at some point actually held like liquid mercury in your hand or you played around with it on a table. I guess I'm of that generation, right? I was of that generation when I was a kid, like, oh, look, there's some mercury and you had some mercury on the table and you kind of pushed it around and things like this. This is what we did in sense we've realized like, well, maybe that's not the safest thing to do, but uh, I seem to be okay so far. But, but that's your inorganic mercury is that liquid, silvery ball of mercury that's on a table versus this methyl mercury. And the methyl, it gets methylated when it uh, goes through a metabolic process in organisms, so your bacteria and things like this. The methyl mercury is much, much more toxic to you than the inorganic mercury. If you were consumed the inorganic mercury, about 1% of it would end up being transferred through your GI tract into your bloodstream, where the methyl mercury up to 90% or higher of it is transferred into your bloodstream uh, from your GI tract. So just how readily it's absorbed, the methylmercury is much, much more readily absorbed into your GI tract than it is the inorganic mercury. And that makes it more dangerous. Uh, so this whole speciation thing's worth, the, actually methylmercury, because of some other factors then too on how it like gets and then transfers into the neurological system because it's more nonpolar, tends to be a thousand times more toxic than the inorganic mercury. So one of the things we thought um, that we didn't get around to is even in this process, if we could even convert the methyl mercury 
into like an inorganic mercury within the fish tissue, we'd be re lowering the toxicity within that fish tissue um, by a thousand times and not even removing the mercury out of it. So, so one of the things that I wanted to try to get to and I never did is doing that through electrochemical processes. And it just, like I said, we just didn't have the time to get that far on things. So in conclusion, um, we all know methylmercury now is bad for us and hopefully we understand a little bit of why some of the reasons is uh, the approach of trying to remove mercury from these fish fillets once you have them was through under acidic conditions, reducing agents and under this vacuum condition. And we did achieve extra extractions up to 50% of the mercury out of the fish tissue. Um, it's not a process right now that would be usable for human consumption, but the concept itself is there and we kind of proved that it does work in, in theory. Um, and the extract is more efficient as you keep decreasing the pH and increasing the surface area. Um, so it works, although it's not practical yet. Future goals. Uh, future goals is we, one of the things that we actually tried, we tried gold because gold is another compound that has a high affinity or binding to mercury. And we tried to use gold in this process. Um, not, we weren't really very successful with that. But the other thing that's not listed on here that I think would maybe be maybe the best thing is an electrochemical process where we convert it to methylmercury, just the inorganic methylmercury, and we just leave it at that. And we wouldn't have to put these fish tissues under maybe like acidic conditions or any other sort of compromising chemical solutions. And we could, and we could achieve this throughout the entire fish tissue very efficiently also as, as I guess what an electrochemical process might have. The, the, the process of. All right, so acknowledgements. I got myself, got the UW Whitewater Undergraduate Research Project. They've been very supportive in this. The chemistry department, our honors program, the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. Uh, they're all like very strong supporters of, a, of this project. Uh, acknowledgements here are some of the individuals from specifically the Office of Research and Sponsored Program. A lot of these individuals have gone elsewhere in the meantime because it's a little bit old on the process. But I want to especially thank Weiss's Technology Foundation here. They provided a grant that allowed us to do a lot of this foundation work. Uh, we've involved lots of undergraduates getting great experience. The folks, Dan Newman and Ted Thornton, that provided the vacuum tumblers through Creative Culinary Solutions. And I have a slide here of of all of the references that I pulled information out of since this is being recorded. I wanna get the slide on here. So if people wanna go back and pull references, you can do that. Um, uh, picture references. A little cartoon here that I think is fun. So it's kind of a, uh, <laughs> see, we've said that in seafood, especially on these higher predator fish, mercury is a problem, but Got a nice little cartoon here of two sharks. And so why are we not supposed to eat humans anymore? And it's because toxic levels of mercury thanks to their fillings and their teeth. So even, even though we talk about this consumption, obviously we don't use mercury fillings to fill our teeth anymore. Uh, we, we found substitutes, but you know we used to, and that was a, another problem. Mercury, so. Uh, I do have a friend in the audience, I think Stacy Kincaid. Um, I want to throw a plug out there. Uh, she's being involved in the, uh, a solar project to create a solar farm in the Darien area. Obviously, if we start producing electricity through alternative energy sources like solar energy, we can reduce the amount of energy we're consuming through coal-fired power plants that help um, create a cleaner environment that helps uh, mediate problems such as my talk was addressing today. Um, and I thought there was, no, I think that's it. So I'm gonna hit us, I'm gonna escape here. I'm gonna stop sharing. And I am going to go back to. Um, Thank you so much, that was excellent. I'm gonna open the floor up to questions at this point. So anybody who would like to unmute ask a question, I would welcome questions, discussions, thoughts, anything you'd like to ask. Um, I'm listening. I'm gonna ask a question if that's okay. 
you can um, ask. I uh, really like that you um, are doing this. It's uh, overdue, and I mean, obviously, it would be ideal if we didn't have all the mercury entering into our lakes and so on. But um, that's my question. Also, is what human behaviors? You mentioned some things broadly, but what can we do to reduce the impact? Um, the solar farms is a great idea. What else? Uh, you know, you, you know, it's the little things. Like th these are the global questions, you're right. So, you, like obviously, this is a this is an issue here where like why why are we getting increased levels of mercury in our waters and 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 it's a and it's a very difficult problem to address. So little things like energy savings, you know, something as simple as, you know, an LED light bulb that consumes less energy would, would be, you know, is anything that reduces energy from an electrical standpoint is going to help in the fact that maybe we can, uh, I, I, I am going to put a plug out to the, to that energy industry, the energy, the coal fired power plants have done an excellent job at putting scrubbers in the stacks in the last decade or so that scrub out the mercury now. So the, the, those power plants themselves have, you know, recognized like, oh, this is something that we need to address. This is a problem. And they've done a very good job of it. So a lot of, a lot of the power industry has like voluntarily just stepped up and said, you know what, we're going to be responsible and we're going to do this. Unfortunately, um, at a federal level, we don't like to regulate things. I don't want to kind of get political here, but I mean, that, that's just the reality we live in. So if it's not regulated, it's up to the um, power industry themselves to be responsible. And a lot of the power industry is responsible, but that still means you have some old power plants out there that don't have scrubbers in their stacks and it continues to be a problem moving forward. So it's, you know, I don't know what you do under, under those situations, but from a global standpoint, um, we're kind of stuck with the problem right now. And it's, it's, like I said, it's such a small amount of mercury that has to get into our waters that creates such a big problem that, and, and, it's, and it's a problem that, you know, you don't eat a meal and then you don't get sick the next day. So it's a problem that like a lot of people, it's just easy to ignore, I guess. When it's something like, when you develop a health problem because this is something that has happened over 20 years, you know, you can't put your finger on it. This is the day that I developed this problem. This was kind of an accumulative effect over 20 years. So part of it is, is just a, just a kind of an awareness of nothing else. I'd like to ask a question. How, okay. How about other fish that comes from oceans or farms in the oceans, like from Norway, do they have the, enough mercury or any mercury um looks like this is Dimitri. yes yes the answer to your question is is yes they do um some of the cleaner waters like around the scandinavian countries obviously have lower levels of mercury in them so those tend to be like the the fishing industries where you get a higher quality of fish and they can actually market their product based on that now the level of mercury again in that fish is going to be on how long that fish is lived has lived before it's harvested. So obviously smaller tuna are safer for you than the very large tuna. Uh, your larger predator fish that tend to live longer are gonna have higher levels of fish than some of your other fish that um, don't live as long. So any fish that can be raised within a year or two, maybe two or three years, that's kind of a short lived time frame. And if you can, on farms that you can do controlled environments, those are gonna be very low levels of fish. But mercury, unfortunately, is just one of these things that's just naturally in our surroundings also. It's just ubiquitous. And, and, and it's over the last, you know, we went through a long period in our country where we use mercury in a lot of products and a lot of processes. It's so, so it's just it's just around us, I guess. And so it's in our oceans naturally. So it's one of these problems that we are aware of now. Now there's certain regions, like there's areas around Japan and stuff that had chemical processing going on where they dumped large quantities of mercury, especially methane mercury into like some, some, uh, some, some bays and, and regions where the fish in those regions are just absolutely not safe to eat. So through contamination, it, it is a regional thing. The Scandinavian countries, it tends to be a very clean region of the world. So fish in that region, is safer. What about 
salmon, whether it's from a salmon farm or if it's from uh, the ocean. Um, I, I'm guessing that if it's like salmon from a farm, it's going to have lower levels of mercury. Usually those are very controlled levels where they're aware of things like this and they're trying to control and keep, you know, the, their, their farm environment as clean as possible. Where you just, you can't control the ocean anymore. What's in the ocean is in the ocean and that's where we're at. So those, the salmon from the ocean, you'd think like, oh, that's a natural product, not from a farm. Um, they, the the salmon from our natural waters or any fish from our natural waters tend to be higher in mercury than from the farms, unfortunately. Are there any other um, scholars besides you that are working on trying to break that bond? Or are you, I mean, are you building on some other research? It really sounds like you just started this. Uh, line. Yeah, it's one of these, <laughs> it's been it's touched overdue. on through the past few decades here and there, like, uh, but no, there's no major research component there. UW-Madison, they played around with it a little bit. Uh, it's a tough nut to crack, to be honest with you. So the one thing that hasn't been tried, though, that has occurred to me is the electrochemical process, maybe. Uh, we've tried to do like this through chemical processes, just doing you know, chemical bonding extraction techniques to our traditional chemical techniques that we use in the laboratory. And, and with mild success, very hard to make it practical, I guess, is what we're finding. But, but I do think there could possibly be a potential if people would be accepting the fact that if we could just convert it from methyl mercury to inorganic mercury, um, that that could be a good alternative to a safer product even. I noticed um, you said that on one of the slides that Wisconsin is the number two fishing destination in the country. <laughs> I'm curious. Where's the number one destination? You know, I don't even know. I should know that, I, but, I, but I don't know where that number two. Um, you know, we have lots of lakes in Wisconsin, obviously. Yeah. I've um, been told more than Minnesota, but I, I don't know that for a fact, so I don't want to step on anybody's toes if they are from Minnesota. Uh, it's, uh, so I don't know where that number one fishing destination is, but Wisconsin, I think we kind of said maybe, uh, I'm not for sure. Oh, uh, Cheryl, you'll have to unmute. Oh, thank you. Um, when you're speaking of farm raised fish, I've always had so many warnings about not eating farm raised fish because of what they, the water that they are in or the, the solutions they are in. But yeah, yeah, they tend to be like high density fish populations then that are higher in nitrates and some, you know, mm -hmm. obviously it's, it's hard to keep those water clean of just um, waste yes. products, I guess. I under, and then I think about the Friday night fish consumption in Wisconsin. That's <laughs> pretty amazing. Yeah. Oh, maybe not. Maybe so that's good. why we only traditionally do a Friday night because it abides by it. the, our, our, <laughs> Our, our limit restrictions of once a week, we, we, we stick to it, not even knowing it. Uh -huh. And then also I think about my, my tuna melts and I like to have white albacore tuna, but when I saw your chart, I thought, oh, I should get a lower grade <laughs> expensive tuna. Uh, yeah. So that was different too. Yeah, it's kind of oh. ironic there. Your lower grade, yeah. smaller tuna is actually safer from a mercury standpoint. True. Well, I, I also learned. noticed. Oh, yeah, I'm done. I noticed also the mackerel um, was on the chart, and um, purchasing mackerel comes in this tiny size can. So I always just thought it was a tiny fish. <laughs> so apparently, it was one of the fish to avoid as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. the larger predator fish. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? We, we used to hear of all of the smelt harvesting in the Great Lakes. What is the issue around that now? You know, I, I don't have the answer to that question, but I was just, it, it was ironic. I just visited Door County this summer, and as I was sitting up in Door County, I, you know, I was thinking, when I was a kid, I remember when we'd go and we'd, we'd, we'd net and we'd catch smelt when I was a kid and now you don't see it happening anymore. And I don't know what happened to that fish industry, but it's, 
But it's the same with the perch industry in Green Bay and the perch industry around Milwaukee. I think what happened there is, is I think we've got, our waters got contaminated through other pollutants. And even in Green Bay right now, there's a dead zone. So which means that because of the um, amount of phosphate that has gotten in the water, it allows for the bacteria to grow in the water to a level that essentially takes all of the oxygen out of the water. And when the fish and at these deep levels and when the fish go into these deep, deep zones, essentially they suffocate and they all die. So I think what's happened is, is like we've, this is a whole different issue. This has got nothing to do with mercury, but the, what I know about the waters in Wisconsin is, is as we've added higher levels of phosphate into the waters, we've created increased bacterial growths and algae growths and this increased algae growths actually create huge dead zones within some of our regions in the Great Lakes that kill massive amounts of fish at a time. Okay, I have a question out there from Jack. What alternatives to uh, stannous chloride could we use to make? So, so we're looking for alternatives to stannous chloride, which is a Reducing agent, essentially. That's why we tried ascorbic acid, which ascorbic acid is a reducing agent. Unfortunately, ascorbic acid doesn't work at low pHs as, as, as much as it does at a pH of seven. That's why ascorbic acid is good for us because it's really effective at pH seven where the pH of our blood is at. But at these more acidic conditions, not, not as great. So we got to look for some other natural, I guess, antioxidants, if you will, uh, to replace the stannous chloride is essentially is what the goal is there. So we've been kind of, you know, looking at some various vitamins and other things that would be natural antioxidants to replace the stannous chloride. Are there any other um, metals or anything you mentioned? Um, I can't remember which metal you mentioned. Is it that not the mercury that, but um. I don't know. Co copper keeps coming to my mind because well, of its antibacterial properties. Yeah, copper. No, that copper really from a, to the formula. I don't think. I don't know. Does it? Copper from an aquatic system. You know. I guess this is what I do. I do metal. So copper is a real problem to aquatic systems, and the reason being is, is we have hemoglobin. So in our hemoglobin, we have an iron center that carries oxygen. You know, throughout our system. Well, fish have a copper. Globin. So, so the oxygen binds the copper in fish. So that being a key component, elevated levels in copper in aquatic systems are really detrimental to like the fish populations. So copper is a real issue if you start getting copper contaminations into the water. Hey, John, can you hear me? This is Stacey. Yeah, Stacey, I can hear you. Hey, um, I just wanted to, um, you know, as it impacts fish uh, life um, quality as well as human health, um, something that's really been um, and will be continue to be impactful for Wisconsin watersheds and fish health would be, and it's kind of a stretch, but um, utility scale solar is one of those things that's very impactful right now in our state. And I just want to um, I, I'm friends with John and he mentioned he was doing this presentation. I just wanted to add that these projects uh, help greatly in the reduction of phosphate and nitrates into our watersheds. So I know as, as people on this call are environmentally minded, um, these projects are going to continue to improve watersheds, um, fish health and human health. And it's just something to think about um, other ways that we can start to impact that. Um, in the state of Wisconsin, since we are such a destination and fish consumption is high. Um, just something to think about as you're thinking about the big picture and making impact. So just thought I would add that. Thanks, Stacey. It's hard to argue that solar is a bad idea. <laughs> hey, Rita, are we almost there, Rita? Yeah, I think um, we could call it unless there are any more questions. Um, I would just like to thank everybody for participating today, if that's the case. It's, um, it's always a great opportunity to share um, what yeah, I can yeah. with individuals, and I thank individuals for participating and being a part of it and listening.
I really appreciated, uh, John, the way you gave the background and you explained your methodology so clearly and not being a chemist, it was really great to follow. And um, I feel like I learned the impact of your work. So thank you so much for taking time to speak with all of us. And um, I'm sure everybody appreciates it. And I want all of you to know that Diane Micklebank from the Senior Center will be sending out an evaluation via email to you. And if you could take a moment to click on the link that you get and just click through five or 10 questions. I don't remember how long it is, but it's quite easy to click through uh, to show um, your impression of uh, Professor Enix uh, for, to John's uh, talk today. And we thank him, all of us thank you very much. So if you want to exit uh, the, the program, I'm going to end it in a moment, but you can leave by hovering your mouse in your lower right-hand corner and a red button that says leave, and then another button that comes up.